When I say the word clock, most people think about a device that shows the current time, hours, minutes, and seconds. In computing, a clock signal determines the speed of the hardware and by extension the speed of the software that hardware is running. Our unit of measurement for this is Hertz. Take one second from our measurement for time of day and split that second by how many cycles the computing device experiences within that second. Cycles per second is the clock speed. You've likely heard terms like gigahertz or megahertz before in reference to clock speeds for a computer. Clock speed is very relevant for the NES. As new mapper chips and interrupt-based features become available to developers throughout the NES release timeline, understanding execution time relative to cycles becomes more important. A good way to illustrate this timing is perhaps by using real hardware and an oscilloscope, a tool that lets us see electrical signals across a period of time. This is an NES motherboard. And this is the NES CPU. It is based on 6502 architecture and also contains the audio generation hardware. This is the NES Picture Processing Unit, or PPU. It generates the composite video signal output to the television. We've definitely talked about these two before. In fact, while we are here, it's worth noting that interrupt pin 19 on the PPU connects to NMI pin 33 on the CPU. That is your signal path used so the PPU can signal the CPU that we have reached the end of a frame and it's time to update your graphics. Now for the timing. This is a crystal. It has an oscillation frequency of 21.47727 MHz. This frequency is the foundation and driving force behind our clockwork. Everything begins here. That said, this speed seems a bit fast for an NES. Well, this is just the beginning. If we connect a probe to the crystal and examine the frequency as a waveform on the oscilloscope, it looks like this. An oscillation, a series of repeating cycles, up and down in our case. Put simply, this is the tick, tick, tick of the NES, the heartbeat. A single cycle travels up to a peak over center, down to a negative peak below, and returns to center. This crystal's frequency of 21.47727 MHz means there are close to 21.47 million cycles per second. We route this clock signal, this foundation of time, to multiple places in the NES, places that need to operate thanks to this ticking. Let's start with the NES CPU. The 21.47 MHz clock signal is fed into pin 29 of the CPU, and the CPU divides this number by 12 to get its clock speed of 1.789773 MHz. The same 21.47 MHz clock signal is fed to pin 18 of the PPU and divided by 4 to get its clock speed of 5.369318 MHz, three times the speed of the CPU. So we have our CPU speed and our PPU speed, and both are created from the same source of oscillation, our crystal. Let's illustrate this relationship using only sine waves. I know some of you more familiar with digital computing are thinking about pulses, duty cycles, and more. Let's keep it simple and stick to analog oscillation for this illustration. This sine wave represents our clock source, our crystal. Let's migrate it from the oscilloscope to generated graphics. This sine wave is our PPU clock, our source divided by four. This sine wave is our CPU clock, our source divided by 12. The cycles for each have the same starting time and are lined up for this illustration. Time is passing as we move to the right. This example of a CPU instruction requires two CPU cycles to execute. That would be this much time, two CPU cycles worth of time. If you look above that, the same passage of time contains six PPU cycles. The PPU does what it needs to do to output a video signal to the TV at this clock speed and was doing the specifics of that very thing as the CPU was executing this instruction. This would be a good time to move to the event viewer in an emulator to better illustrate the relationship between three PPU cycles per one CPU cycle. The event viewer illustrates when a moment in time occurs for the CPU using a small box and that box sits on top of what the PPU is currently drawing to the television screen. This window is a wonderful way to monitor execution time and see what both the CPU and PPU are doing at a moment in time. Where our box is on top of the graphics indicates when the CPU execution took place in relation to the PPU frame output. 
If we mouse over a box that represents when a CPU instruction was executed, that overlay tells us the when by providing both the scan line and the PPU cycle at the moment the CPU execution of this instruction began. This example uses two boxes that illustrate the start of two instructions in code. Our focus is on the first instruction, and the timing of the second helps represent the end of the first. This example took two CPU cycles to execute. Three PPU cycles occur during one CPU cycle. The PPU can output one pixel per cycle, therefore the PPU output six pixels worth of information during the time it took to execute our two cycle CPU instruction. The debugger tells us the same thing, but we monitor numbers instead of rendered graphics. We can see our current CPU cycle and our current PPU cycle, as well as which scan line the PPU is currently rendering. When we step over this code and execute it, the CPU cycles increase by two and the PPU cycles increase by six. The CPU and PPU work in tandem. They do what they do at different speeds from one another, but their timing originates from the same place. While the relationship between the timing of both may only seem to be an interesting piece of trivia, the clock speeds chosen are not arbitrary. Arbitrary or not, why do we need them in the first place? Why does a computer need cycles? When you insert a cartridge, you provide the what. The code and data in the program ROM and the graphics and the character ROM, for example. That's the what. The clock drives the when. If all of the code data and graphics contained in ROM and RAM are ones and zeros, they need to travel back and forth to be processed. If the ones and zeros are the lifeblood of a game running on the NES, the clock signal source is the heartbeat that circulates them through the system. Without a heartbeat, those ones and zeros aren't going anywhere. I mentioned that these clock speeds are not arbitrary, so how about we explain this using an example that is more concrete, one where timing is pretty darn important, the television. The PPU has to constantly tell the TV what to draw. It must continue to do this regardless of game logic and do so at a rate that is within the specifications of the television. There is a time requirement here. And by the way, there are videos on this very channel that provide the foundation of how TV signals work. They may help you with this next part. How do we get from the timing of this crystal to the output of this image on the screen? Let's find out. The resolution of the NES is 256 by 240. We can place those graphics inside the event viewer and see that there is more space, more time available, most notably to the right of the image as well as underneath it. The reason for this is that the video signal contains a horizontal sync pulse to signal that the electron beam in the television should move down to draw the next line. Likewise, time is required after the frame is drawn to return the electron beam to the top of the screen. A vertical sync pulse is provided during a vertical blanking period. Just as it takes time to draw the image to the screen, so also does time pass during these blanking periods. Again, the PPU accounts for this. It has to do so. Its job is to render a television signal. If we move beyond examining the graphics alone and consider all the clock cycles the PPU requires to render a full frame of video, we can calculate some numbers that make sense. Let's refer to the PPU cycles as dots. Sometimes a pixel from the NES graphics is output during a dot. Sometimes no graphics are output during a dot. The point is that time is always passing for the PPU and by extension, the television signal. 341 PPU dots per line by 262 scan lines. Not 240, that would only be the graphics time. 262. TV scan lines are more than just lines we see on the screen. So how many PPU dots are there per frame? A simple multiplication would give us this number. However, there is one scan line that is one dot shorter on every other frame. The reasons for that are better explained in a separate video. Therefore, the calculation for dots per frame would be 341 times 261 plus 340.5. This last one is an average as we alternate between 340 dots and 341 dots on even and odd frames. That brings our dot total per frame to 89,341.5. Why on earth does this matter? Take the PPU clock speed of 5.369318 megahertz and divide it by 89,341.5 dots per frame and we get 
60.0988 Hz, the vertical refresh rate of the NES output to the television. As a bonus, take our crystal frequency once again and divide it by 6 and we get 3.579545 MHz, which is the color burst frequency for NTSC composite video. Are these values a coincidence? No, they're by design. No operating system, no abstraction layers, components are all tied to the same clock. This is bare metal development and knowledge of the clock is important. As we turn away from the simplicity of only updating graphics at the end of every frame, or maybe constantly checking to see if a sprite zero hit has occurred for something like split screen scrolling, we begin to use new mapper chips like the MMC3 and open the door to using interrupts as needed. Those interrupts require the consistency of time, the clockwork we expect from the NES. It isn't just about duration, it's also about a moment. While logic for the CPU can have an inconsistent start time across frames, the output of the PPU occurs at a much more constant rate. We'll see additional mappers, and by extension the software that uses them, lean on PPU timing to trigger CPU interrupts. Multi-directional scrolling and parallax scrolling have arrived on the scene thanks to these interrupts. Some games use them well. Other games need some work. Like, comment, and subscribe to continue our journey. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested, and thanks for watching.